Hi, everybody. Just proof of the excitement around this talk. We're getting started early. Everybody's here, as far as we can tell. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Happy Constitution Day. Um, I'm Yuval Levin. I'm director of the new Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies Research Division here at AI. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce our Constitution Day speaker. The research division is, as I say, new here, but an emphasis on the Constitution and on the study of core American principles is, of course, not at all new at AI. This has long been the home of great constitutional scholarship from the days when Antonin Scalia and Robert Bork and Bob Baldwin were scholars here right to the last few years as our citizenship program has sponsored some enormously important work under the leadership of Gary Schmidt and Rebecca Burgess, who also made tonight's event possible. This is the eighth annual Constitution Day lecture, and these lectures are named for one of those giants of AI's constitutional scholarship, a true giant, the great Walter Burns, scholar and champion of American constitutionalism, whose work was so important to enabling the flowering of originalism, to deepening our understanding of the work of the framers, uh, and to shaping generations of scholars in these areas, certainly myself included. Walter would have really loved our subject today, as he loved our speaker today. Um, and we who are uh, picking up the work in this area are very much guided by his vision and his outlook. So we wanted to start this evening with a little video about Walter and his work to recall that great teacher and colleague and to put us all in the mood to think seriously about the Constitution. So let's take a look at that real quick and remember Walter Burns. Walter Burns was at once a scholar and a patriot. And that, unfortunately, in the contemporary world and in contemporary America, is kind of rare. Patriotism is not natural, but has to be taught or somehow acquired. And the question was then, and I suppose still is, how was this new patriotism to be taught or somehow acquired by later generations of citizens? On the one hand, uh, he loved the country, thought people had to be encouraged to love it for reasons that had been stated by Walter's great hero, uh, Abraham Lincoln, especially in a free country. It can't be taken for granted that people will simply love the country and do the things that are needed to protect it. This was not simply uh, the rah-rah patriotism of a war hero, which he was. So Walter was a veteran of World War II. He had served from the absolute beginning in the Navy. He had seen action. He used to like to tell my children he had taken North Africa single-handedly, when they were still young enough to believe that. <laughs> and so we had a very powerful sense of what the country had been through. And Walter in particular had a, a sort of odyssey after World War II. But eventually they pitched up in Taos, New Mexico, where a writer's artist colony had been founded. He was going to be the, you know, great American novelist, but then eventually he uh, burned the manuscript. I just decided that, that that wasn't him and wound up uh, going to the uh, University of Chicago. And uh, someone told him, well, you have to take a course with this fellow, Leo Strauss. And Walter said, ah, I said, I'll do it next semester, next semester. <laughs> and finally he did. <laughs> he was very greatly influenced by Leo Strauss, and Leo Strauss said, we should go back and read Aristotle. We should go back and read old books because we can still learn things from old books. And it's not enough to say, I don't completely agree. All right, you don't completely agree. What is it you think is right? And if you start by saying, well, no one is right, if there is no right, you're just gonna go through life chortling and chuckling and being frivolous and silly. And that isn't the life Walter Burns was gonna lead. Walter believed that uh, true patriotism for an American uh, includes an appreciation of self-criticism. We are not expected to love our country simply because it is our country. Love can be blind, and love of country, like love of wife or husband or lover, can be blind too. But ours is not supposed to be a blind patriotism. But he always insisted that our criticism of the Constitution be fully informed. That criticism had to be based upon a, a full uh, understanding. Uh, and it was that fuller understanding that he spent a good deal of his life in reviving. Walter Burns was one of a very small group of scholars who made the founding relevant again and really fundamental to our understanding of ourselves. 
We take it for granted now that, well, of course, if you study America, you have to read the Federalist Papers and you have to think about the Constitution and the Constitutional Convention and John Marshall, not just the latest Supreme Court cases, and you have to read Lincoln. That was not the case when Walter Burns began writing on these topics in the 1950s and into the 1960s. And he and a small group of friends and colleagues of his really uh, revived the study of the founders, showed why you couldn't understand America without understanding the founders. I think part of what happened to Walter and to a lot of other people is that the left changed out from under them and uh, came to really reject the vision of the Constitution. To be a partisan of the Constitution, which is if Walter was any kind of partisan, I think that was his party, by late in his life meant that he was a conservative by default. But I don't think he was a conservative in the way that the conservative movement understood that term. I can see how Walter would be uncomfortable with the term, and a lot of people of his generation were, but the fact is he and they transformed conservatism in a way that made it more like them. I think what today's young conservatives mean by thinking of Walter as a conservative is purely a compliment. Uh, it means that they see themselves shaped by his teachings. Walter Burns was at AEI uh, when I came here in 1986. Uh, and uh, he was here for all of my tenure as president, up until his 90th birthday. He was in the office every day. Right up to the end, uh, he was the complete uh, intellectual and, uh, and uh, the archetype of what AEI has always tried to uh, promote and insinuate into larger political debate. When Lincoln was a young man, he gave a speech about the Founding Fathers in which he called them a forest of giant oaks. And I thought Walter very much represented that image. These were people in the Founding whom Lincoln felt had greater challenges than his own generation. Walter Burns was one of the giant oaks Lincoln spoke about, and he's left an extraordinary legacy for those of us who are still here at AEI, his scholarship, and his great strengths as a colleague and friend to many here. honored to have uh, Walter's wife Irene with us, other members of the family tonight, um, and to remember him in the way that I think he would have loved to be remembered, which is by thinking together about the Constitution. Um, we, are, uh, we at AI are certainly committed to holding up the mantle um, of his work, and in the coming months you'll see, I think, an enormous amount of work coming out of AI on some of these core constitutional questions that mattered so much uh, to Walter. You can keep track of what we're up to. Uh, we'll have a, a, a large number of public events, of publications. Uh, the very next one, which I should mention, will be on October 1st right here, uh, a panel discussion on the role of the Chief Justice in our system of government, hosted by our new resident scholar, Adam White. And given this new emphasis here, or re-emphasis uh, on the subject, and given it's enormous important in this moment in our country's life, it's a particular honor and privilege to welcome tonight's speaker to AI. Um, James Stoner is the Herman Moyes Professor and Director of the Eric Vogelin Institute in the Department of Political Science at Louisiana State University. He's the author of many books, including especially pertinent to tonight's lecture, Common Law Liberty and Common Law and Liberal Theory, as well as countless articles and essays over the years. He's a senior fellow of the Witherspoon Institute at Princeton. He's been a member of the National Council on the Humanities and a celebrated teacher. I've known a number of his students over the years, and Jim is the kind of teacher that students are still talking about decades after leaving his classroom. And his subject tonight is one about which he has been teaching all of us for decades, the deep and complicated relationship between the common law and our constitutional order, a relationship with a lot to offer our particular dysfunctional, polarized political moment. It's a terribly important subject, and we could hardly ask for a better guide. Jim's remarks tonight will be followed by a Q&A with all of us and then uh, a little reception outside with wine and cheese to talk together. And so let's welcome James Stoner. Well, thank you, Yuval, and thanks to all of you for coming out this evening. Uh, it's a great honor to speak here at uh, the American Enterprise Institute. I've learned 
much from the scholars here over the years uh, who have uh, made such a great contribution to our country, uh, including uh, many I, I count, or some I count as friends, uh, and that included Walter Burns. Walter uh, learned, uh, I think it was when he was up to give a lecture for me on my first job at Goucher College, that I would soon be leaving that job and going to Louisiana State University, where it turns out he had started his own career before uh, apparently calling Wilmore Kendall and asking to be <laughs> returned <laughs> up north. And uh, so I think he always had a kind of fondness for me for enduring uh, uh, Louisiana. Uh, but I, I once heard him speak at AEI, at the old uh, quarters. Well, actually, I say I heard him speak, but I was the one on the program, and uh, uh, so was uh, Michael McConnell, and Judge Bork was the moderator, and our topic was tradition. And at a certain point, maybe inspired by what we had said, Forrest McDonald of the University of Alabama got up and spoke for a while about states' rights. <clears throat> well, at, when he finished and sat down, there was a very loud and noticeable clearing of the throat out in the middle of the audience, <clears throat> and a shout, Bob, <laughs> to uh, Judge Bork, the moderator. And up stood Walter, and he explained to us Mr. Lincoln's theory <laughs> of the union, uh, uh, and, uh, which, which apparently uh, Professor McDonald, fine historian though he was, had overlooked. So uh, when I, I think about originalism, my topic, I think it's one that, uh, that uh, well, Walter Burns was, to me, the original originalist. And I don't know whether or not he would have agreed with what I'm going to say tonight, but I think he would have appreciated the topic. Now, it will not have escaped the notice of uh, my listeners this evening that the title of this lecture, Common Law Originalism, seems to encase a contradiction or at least present a paradox. I'll begin by discussing why this is so, and then I hope to persuade you that if both terms, originalism and common law, are properly understood, the paradox is resolved. I mean to argue not only that taking common law seriously should make one attentive to originalism, but also that originalism, if it is to be complete, needs to attend to the fact that the Constitution we celebrate this evening was written in a legal environment formed by common law that our written constitution emerged from a tradition of unwritten law. So much at least I planned to say when I chose my title last spring. But reviewing the major decisions of the Supreme Court last term, thinking that I would find a few illustrations to buttress my thesis, I discovered that in fact, common law was subject to extended treatment in a number of the justices' opinions. And I've become convinced that this is indeed no accident as the new majority on the court brings originalist argumentation to the forefront, the justices have noticed that to understand the meaning of constitutional language, recourse must be had to pre-existing law, and that often means common law. Besides, the question of the authority of precedent over against original intention has naturally come to the forefront itself as feebly grounded case law begins to feel its frailty. All this gives a certain timeliness to what I have to say, or at least I'll see whether I can persuade you of that too when I discuss several cases, which being a political scientist and not a lawyer, I'll attempt to do in a matter, in a manner that avoids tedious detail at the risk of technical error. Finally, since I think ours is still a Republican form of government, I'll conclude with a few words about what the common law way of thinking means for legislation, where those of us whose office is merely citizen might be thought through our representatives to have some say. In our politically polarized era, perhaps I should say in the notoriously polarized era, for American politics have always been characterized by partisan division, the Constitution of the United States might seem to serve as a common point of reference. Whether Democrat or Republican, the overwhelming majority of Americans concede that the Constitution is something that we have in common the written rules that govern political competition, and perhaps a few principles, especially concerning basic rights, that we all share. But a moment's reflection or a little experience teaches that whatever our unity regarding the Constitution as a symbol, in practice, partisanship reemerges when it comes to interpreting what the Constitution means in our world today. In the one corner, we find the originalists, 
those who claim or at least aspire to interpret the Constitution according to the meaning given to its clauses at the time they were enacted. For Articles 1 through 7 in 1787 to 88, at the time of ratification, for the Bill of Rights a few years later, uh, for amendments 13 through 15 at the close of the Civil War and the beginning of Reconstruction, and so forth. Originalists recognize that the courts and the Supreme Court have not always been faithful to the original meaning or have been, been mistaken when they've tried, but they insist that fidelity to the text is essential to vindicate the popular character of the Constitution, its source in we the people, whenever we have chosen to engage in the solemn and authoritative act of Constitution making. In the other corner, we find the living constitutionalists who see in the imposition of the dry meaning of old texts either the dead hand of the past or a glove that hides a political fist in the present. The people who wrote the Constitution long ago are an emphatically not the people today, they remind us, or given demographic change, even their ancestors, uh, not least, or at least not the ancestors of today's majority. There's much in the Constitution that living constitutionalists can live with, particularly the procedural rules, although they find some of these, like the Electoral College, sometimes chafe. And there are several principles that they genuinely admire, for example, concerning civil liberties, or some of them, majority rule, and equal protection, but they would interpret these expansively and treat them aspirationally as goals for the future rather than confined by the specific meanings they had in the 18th or 19th centuries. It's hard to say who's winning this debate. On the one hand, the originalists have had a couple staunch advocates on the Supreme Court, the late Justice Antonin Scalia, and even more consistently, Justice Clarence Thomas, their approach is openly endorsed by one of the major political parties, and they have successfully developed a cottage industry of publication and debate in the law schools, even though law school faculty trend overwhelmingly left, with the liberal faculty now proclaiming their adherence to, quote, living originalism, a half concession. Although the original originalists uh, did not reverse any of the major constitutional developments that they arose to combat, they stanched the expansion of some, especially in the field of criminal law, but also hesitatingly on the question of Congress's commerce power. And they succeeded in gaining constitutional rec recognition for Second Amendment rights to bear arms. On the other hand, while the living constitutionalists have had some trouble developing a catchy name or a jurisprudential theory, they've not only held on to the gains of the post-New Deal and the Warren Courts, but have even succeeded in expanding non-textual rights on questions of sex discrimination, and especially sexual autonomy and its encumbrances. Theirs, they might say, is the vector of change, the only question being how quick or slow the progress. Besides, they point out that the party of originalism, uh, they point out to the party of originalism, there's nothing conservative about upsetting uh, long-established precedents. The war in court, after all, is about as far away from us as the War of 1812 was from the Civil War, and its decisions and even its way of deciding are now deeply woven into American law. Now, the best explanation and defense of what I've been calling living constitutionalism, uh, or the living constitution mode of jurisprudence, is, I think, a 1996 Chicago Law Review article by Chicago law professor David Strauss, called Common Law Constitutional Interpretation, developed later in a series of uh, subsequent articles. Strauss explicitly takes on originalism and articulates its alternative, which he anchors in what he calls the common law method. American courts, even when at making reference to the text of the Constitution, in fact proceed by this method, not only in the areas of law such as torts and contracts where unwritten common law is known to govern, as big pharma is learning once again. Uh, but really, in everything that they do, the courts do, including the interpretation of statutes, and even more so in the interpretation of constitutional clauses. Judges in a common law system generally follow precedent, and when they depart from it, it is not only, or it is only, in circumstances that Strauss thinks are pretty clearly defined. Their general attitude, these common law judges, uh, is conservative, stick to the tried and true. And although Strauss himself is clearly liberal in his sentiments, 
He sees value in the gradualness of change the system encourages, if only because gradual change is less easily reversed. Besides, he notes, even the father of modern conservatism, Edmund Burke, not to mention good old Aristotle, acknowledged the need for the law to be flexible and to accommodate change in the world. David Strauss's argument is partly analytical and even descriptive. His claim is that judges decide constitutional, cases of constitutional law in ways better explained by the common law method than by the method of originalism, even when they cite the text or historical evidence from the time of its enactment. The common law method places precedent and adherence to precedent at the center of legal discussion. In a common law system like our own, judges begin the consideration of any legal question by asking how that question, or one similar to it, has been decided in the past. To imagine an example, one might cite the First Amendment's guarantee of freedom of speech in a case involving prosecution for obscenity. But the text alone does not settle the matter, and evidence of prosecution at the time of, first, of the, the First Amendment was ratified is scant, and that's not sufficient e either. Instead, the court will probably look back no further than Roth v. U.S. in the 1950s or Miller v. California in the 1970s, and then at more recent cases too, to determine where the law now stands. This approach guides their judgment and limits arbitrariness, Strauss notes, and it guides lawyers in advising their clients, ensuring stability and predictability in law. The mindset is traditionalist, Strauss says, but not blindly. It is, he says, a rational traditionalism that presumes that rules have been established for reasons and that when judicial bodies have reasoned a case through, their conclusions deserve respect, at least until better reasons can be found. There be, need be no mysticism about traditions having been in place, as the old common law had it in England, so long that the memory of man runneth not to the contrary, and that traditions come to be seen as irrational, such as race discrimination or sex stereotyping, can be abandoned. But these, he supposes, are the exception rather than the rule. Moreover, especially on matters which are morally indifferent, legal formalities, say, or procedural issues, it's important that the law be settled. It's more important that the law be settled than that it be perfect, so people can rely upon it in their own affairs while working around the imperfections. Making law predictable, settled precedent and it embraces a free society, something judges need to understand and that most of them do. Well, I think David Strauss is correct as far as he goes, both descriptively and to some extent normatively. American judges, in fact, work from precedent, even in cases of constitutional law. And despite the impatience one naturally feels, especially when young, in the face of the apparent folly of the past, one ought to inquire about the reason things are done as they are before rejecting them for there are always reasons, sometimes even good ones. And as for the small stuff, predictably, uh, predictability often enough does outweigh perfection. But David Strauss himself overlooks something important about common law that makes his account of the common law method as a competitor to originalism misleading. As he admits, but doesn't emphasize, his reference to common law as a method, apart from the substantive body of law inherited from England, alters the way the term common law would have been understood at the time of the American founding, when Americans claimed the common law heritage as their own. Detaching common law from its roots was the work of Oliver Wendell Holmes, who redefined common law as judge-made law, redefined it so successfully that this new definition has now been taken for granted by law professors, law students, lawyers, and judges for several generations. Strauss does not cite Holmes, but he regularly refers to Holmes's protege, Benjamin Cardozo whose term judicial process is less misleading. You don't have to read the Constitution twice to know that judge-made law is problematic. Legislation or lawmaking powers belong to Congress, so the judicial power must have been supposed to be something else. Holmes meant his definition to be paradoxical, even startling, since his point was to emphasize how common law precedents changed over time, almost imperceptibly at each step but sometimes decisively over the course of centuries. Even then, he did not claim that judges made these changes self-consciously, though now that the truth is out, he thought they should. Sparingly and artfully was his hope in his practice, but honestly and openly, like any other policymaker, looking to the good as he preferred to think of it. 
For Holmes also was a relativist who held not only that the common law evolved, but that all human values are susceptible of change. David Strauss can say all rational traditions should be followed, but the question is who decides what traditions have become irrational and how they reach that judgment. His endorsement not only of the reinterpretation of the commerce power and due process liberty during the New Deal and of the rejection of racial segregation after the Second World War, but also of the line of precedents that issued in and developed from Roe v. Wade indicates that something deeply political, not only professional, is at stake. Customs change to be sure, almost, all, I'm sorry, often unnoticeably, at least at first, but they claim unbroken authority from the past. Even if historical research can show the change, why is the response necessarily to acquiesce in it rather than to see the change as corruption and to seek a return to the tradition as it was followed in a more distant past? Something like this has happened more than once in the history of common law. Sir Edward Cook, in the 17th century heyday of the common lawyers, looked back to the age before Tudor absolutism. And it happens even in our constitutional law. For example, when the criminal protections in the Bill of Rights were revitalized in the mid 20th century after progressive era modification. In other words, even if customs alter, there's no reason to suppose that judges have the power to alter them at will or to declare them altered according to their own perception of change in public opinion. Even if at each step in the development of a line of precedent, they have the duty to draw the best analogy that they can. The law seeks after all, not merely the customary, but the just. According then to what I would call the authentic tradition of common law, that law, though inclusive of ancient customs, some of whose reasons may have been lost to time, is actually anchored in natural law. That is, in what human beings can know about the human good, it's self-defined by human nature. In common law, this was typically expressed negatively. Nothing that was against natural law could be incorporated in common law, even though many of the specific rules or determinations of common law were not settled by natural law one way or the other. Common law can indeed change, first of all by statute, for it was a rule of common law that statutory provisions superseded anything contrary in common law. Moreover, a rule of common law might be altered by judges if circumstances altered, so that the old rule was really no longer the same rule at all, or if new knowledge superseded the reason behind the older rule of law. To take a controversial, if but I think clear, example of the latter, the common law forbade abortion after quickening, but the modern science of embryology has established that there's not a discrete moment after conception when a developing embryo becomes human. Its species character is established when its genetic makeup is complete, and fetal development after that is continuous and largely self-organizing. It would now be irrational in the absence of other law to say that the common law insists on quickening as a division line between permissible and impermissible abortions. A judge would have to inquire into the reason for the established rule. And if that uh, reason was that quickening indicated ensoulment, and so the moment of humanization, the underlying, underlying rule being no taking of an innocent human life, then the common law would protect life from the moment of conception. Even if the old common law rule was evidentiary rather than biological, it might still need to be changed given modern pregnancy tests. As for changes in circumstances, I would give an example from constitutional law. Again, perhaps controversial, at least in this room. Chief Justice Hughes' determination that the modern economy has so changed the circumstances of economic life by subjecting all monetary value to an interlocking whole that rigid interpretation of the contract clause and of distinctions between manufacturing and commerce in the interpretation of the commerce clause must adjust to the new economic reality, that great switch in time of the uh, New Deal, during the New Deal. So it seems to me that appealing to common law against originalism, as David Strauss attempted to do, is persuasive only if one detaches common law from its original meaning, turning it into a relativistic method of managing legal flux by ignoring its anchor in a claim of intrinsic justice. What about looking at the purported opposition between originalism and common law from the alternative perspective, that of constitutional originalism? Here it seems to me an honest originalism would pay more attention to common law than most originalists seem to do. 
In the first place, even the most textually precise originalist will notice that there are technical phrases in the Constitution that can only be explained by reference to common law. During the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, the question was raised whether the term ex post facto applied only to criminal law or also to laws related to the definition of property rights. John Dickinson went home and looked it up in Blackstone, returning the next day to report that it only applied to criminal law, thus prompting the drafting of the contract clause to protect property rights from unjust alteration. What does it mean that the president must be a natural born citizen? The common law is the usual referent here, one born in the country, owing allegiance to its government and law as one born in England would have owed allegiance to the king. But I want to suggest that the common law imbues the Constitution in more than just the technical language. The very term judicial power was meant to refer to courts established like common law courts, where pleading was adversarial rather than inquisitorial, where precedent would be followed, where juries would be impaneled to find facts, even as judges reserved for themselves the law where judges would ordinarily be drawn from the bar rather than separately trained. One sees all of this taken for granted in Hamilton's papers on the courts in the Federalist, or all but the jury, which is of course separately named in the Constitution's text. And just to be sure, a Bill of Rights was quickly added to the Constitution as part of the compromise that ensured its ratification. And many of these amendments put in writing the rights of due process anchored in common law since as far back as Magna Carta. Moreover, the very practice of judicial review, the power of courts to declare statutes unconstitutional and refuse to enforce them, makes no sense outside of the common law context in which the Constitution was formed. It is, after all, a paradoxically unwritten power to enforce a written Constitution. That Americans put our Constitution in writing, unlike the unwritten Constitution of England, was seen as a statute-like improvement on the old common law way. But the defense of the unwritten power of judges to enforce it depends, like much of the way courts decide a common law, upon what Hamilton called the nature and reason of the thing. And in both Federalist 78 and in John Marshall's decision in Marbury v. Madison, the power is defended on analogy to the way common law judges deal with contradictory statutes. If two statutes are at odds, the more recent one is taken as indicating the will of the legislator. But if a constitution and a statute are at odds, the superior authority supersedes, whether it's older or newer. Moreover, the power to decide such things is asserted and defended in the context of a legal case or controversy, the judicial power being the power to decide according to law particular cases brought within its jurisdiction, not the power to range freely as a censor of legislation. The, the proposal of a council of revision having been rejected at Philadelphia. Reflecting on this, by the way, would help guide those on the bench and off who would limit judicial supremacy and return ownership of the Constitution to those who first gave it authority, named in the document's first three words. In short, the supposed polarities of constitutional originalism and common law judging are not opposites if properly understood, but integral to one another. If this were accepted, how might it change the way judges go about interpreting the Constitution and even the way citizens see the law? I don't have a Herculean theory to offer or a method to propose. Uh, that would contradict my whole argument. But let me discuss five cases from the Supreme Court's writtenly, re recently concluded term and a sixth matter now in controversy and suggest how remembering the common law dimension of the Constitution might make a difference in how lawyers go about arguing and how judges go about deciding. The first case I want to discuss is Franchise Tax Board of California v. Hyatt, where the judges split according to the party of the president who opposed them, but not in a way that purely result, a purely result-oriented analysis might have predicted. For the five Republican-appointed judges took the side of the California tax collectors and the four Democratic-appointed ju judges favored the entrepreneur who moved to Nevada, apparently to escape the California income tax. The cases involved 25 years of legal wrangling, and it's still open, by the way, this being its third trip to the Supreme Bench. At issue this time was whether the court should overrule its 1979 decision in Nevada v. Hall, and the majority decides that it should, 
finding that the original meaning of the Constitution was to accord the states absolute sovereign immunity in each other's courts. The question of sovereign immunity has regularly caused such a split, this sort of 5-4 split, Republican-Democrat, over the past quarter century. But in other cases, at issue has been the immunity of the states from suits in federal court, where here the question is the immunity of one state in the courts of another. Uh, since Hall, the court had held that under the full faith and credit clause, state entities were entitled to comity, that is, to be treated in the courts of a sister state as the analogous ent entity would be treated by its own courts. Uh, in an earlier phase, that had led the Supreme Court to reduce a judgment against the California, uh, base, uh, the California Board for harassment from $1 million to $50,000. But now the court held the principle of sovereign immunity, vacated the judgment altogether. Of course, the term sovereign immunity does not appear in the Constitution's text, either in its absolute form as a common law or its permissive form as in the uh, contemporaneous law of nations. But Justice Thomas, writing for the court, dismissed what he called a, quote, a historical textualism that would ignore the principle's implicit premise in the Constitution's structures. States consent to be sued in federal court only by one another, otherwise maintaining their common law immunity. As well as uh, the stunning rebuke issued to the court upon its maiden voyage in constitutional interpretation, Chisholm v. Georgia, uh, that rebuke by the 11th Amendment, which again is silent about the common law principle, but makes explicit that Article Three had been misconstrued. Justice Breyer in dissent in this case uh, reads the Constitution structure differently, eschewing common law and citing rather the law of nations, which encourage comedy. Moreover, he chastises the majority for overruling a settled precedent, none of the usual reasons for upsetting precedent, unworkability, a change in the legal environment, a change in circumstances, and the absence of reliance in interests. None of these, he says, are present in this case. Quote, today's decision can only cause one to wonder which cases the court will overrule next, he concluded, a sentence that was immediately echoed in the press. My second case is Gamble versus United States, decided by a vote of seven to two, with Justice Alito writing for the majority and Justices Ginsburg and Gorsuch in dissent, an interesting pairing. Once again, the justices take up the question of common law, for the issue is double jeopardy, and the question is whether it's violated when a man is convicted for offenses, in this case, an ex-felon possessing a handgun, um, uh, violative of both state and federal law. Alito holds that as the offenses are defined by separate statutes at separate levels, they are by definition not the same offense. He reviews a series of English cases from the 18th century finding that none of them clearly eschews the power of English courts to try offenses alleged to have been tried in a foreign court. To his mind, and to the satisfaction of Justice Thomas, who in a previous case had signaled his willingness to reconsider, to reconsider the so-called dual sovereignty doctrine, uh, to Alito and Thomas, the Fifth Amendment's prohibition against subjecting any person, quote, for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life and limb, applies only to actions of the same sovereign under its own laws. Justice Thomas takes the occasion, perhaps because he was sticking to the precedent, to explain when a precedent, sh a precedent should be overturned, not by taking into account mere matters of policy, he says, nor even following the practices of common law, which he concedes in, uh, is the source of according legal force to precedent and which he helpfully and I think correctly describes as, quote, identifying and applying objective principles of law uh, discerned from natural reason, custom, and other external sources uh, to particular cases. But since federal judges, he thinks, consult only positive law, the Constitution, federal statutes, rules and regulations, and treaties, the rule of reversal should be, quote, demonstrably erroneous precedent, or rather, when there is such, a, such an error, writes Thomas, quote, my rule is simple, we should not follow it, meaning the erroneous precedent. 
although Justice Thomas was not convinced the precedent here is demonstrably erroneous, Justices Ginsburg and Gorsuch think it is. The first because she rejects the notion of dual sovereignty itself, the people being sovereign behind both governments. The latter, Justice Gorsuch, because he differs with the court's narrow reading of English precedents. Their ignoring of the larger principle, the common law, and he adds, the law of ancient Athens, of Rome, of the Old Testament, and the church, all considered deeply unjust, the trying of a person twice and punishing him twice for the same offense. And the problematic character of the American precedents he points out as well, the first of which involved punishment under a state law for harboring a fugitive slave. Uh, the latter, later one stemming from the era before the double jeopardy prohibition was applied by incorporation to the states. For Justice Gorsuch, the precedent observes, uh, this precedent deserves no standing even under Justice Breyer's test. Quote, here's Gorsuch, the only people who've relied on the separate sovereign's exception are prosecutors who have sought to double prosecute and double punish. Now common law makes a brief appearance in the Kaiser v. Wilkie case, where the court by a split vote declined the invitation to abandon the so-called our deference, that is the court's duty to defer to agencies' interpretation of their own regulations, at least if the regulation was genuinely ambiguous in the first place and the agency's interpretation is reasonable, authoritative within their expertise and reflects, quote, fair and considered judgment. Justice Kagan found the hour regime consistent with the Administrative Procedure Act, quoting one of her successors as Dean of Harvard Law School that before the APA, quote, courts used, quote, flexible common law methods to review administrative actions. In his concurrence in the judgment, joined by Justice Thomas and in part by Justices Kavanaugh and Alito, Justice Gorsuch emphatically disagrees. Our should be overruled, he thinks, and since what the court is deferring to may be in some cases an unsupported opinion, uh, uh, as the court itself recognizes in developing that five-part test I just read you, uh, it's far simpler for judges to return to making their own judgments as to the meaning of regulations, as Justice Robert Jackson had insisted in his Skidmore opinion in 1944, a position that he, Gorsuch, thinks is actually mandated by the language of the APA and mandated by the role of the judicial power suppo supposed by the Constitution, which is to in check, which is to check, not merely to ratify executive action. Gorsuch's opinion concludes, as by now you should ex expect, with a section on stare decisis, on precedent, doubting that it even applies in a case like this where at issue is not a rule for the world, but a rule about how judges arrive at their own conclusions, about judicial reasoning, in other words, or about its restraint. The next case I'll mention is American Legion versus the American Humanist Association, the well-noted Bladensburg Cross case, uh, which does not involve common law in any technical sense. In England, of course, common law coexisted alongside a religious establishment and in fact incorporated Christian morals, though not common law, uh, I'm sorry, though not canon law, which belonged in separate courts. The American situation was different, of course, at least in some of the states, and in the practice of others, and of course at the federal level, official recognition of a church and financial support for it was forbidden, though this change seems not to have touched the moral order basically agreed to by all the different denominations. The key precedent in constitutional law of the Establishment Clause is Lemon v. Kurtzman, which, uh, which um, seems unable, however, now for 30 years to command either a majority to affirm it or a majority to overturn it. <laughs> Justice Alito's opinion here gains a majority except for his discussion of this case. Nevertheless, the court seems pleased to simply set that precedent aside and begin instead simply with the assertion of, quote, a presumption of constitutionality for longstanding monuments, symbols, and practices, an approach that goes back at least to the legislative chaplain case in the 1980s, Marsh v. Chambers, and explains as well Van Orden v. Perry, where the court left in place a Ten Commandments monument 
on the Texas Capitol grounds. There's a certain traditionalism at work in Alito's opinion, with its presumption for lo the long standing. Monuments themselves, of course, not changing as customs do, though perhaps their human perception does. And uh, Alito sensed that whatever the original intention was of those who planted the stone, monuments, quote, can become embedded features of a community's landscape and identity. Secularizing the sacred or sacralizing the secular, the justice doesn't quite say. The discussion of the um, commonness of the cross as a symbol of World War I, without mention of the symbol of crusade widely added in, among Americans, or the way in which the war signaled the denouement of Christianity on the continent where it was principally fought. This seems to assure the majority that the cross was meant to be inclusive, as more particularly do the non-Christian names on it. Justice Thomas, meanwhile, swings for the originalist fences. The Establishment Clause, he notes, was written to protect the state arrangement, whatever it was, uh, local establishment or no establishment, from federal preemption. So it's illogical to incorporate it and apply it to the states. Moreover, its terms forbid making laws. Congress shall make no law, not placing monuments. He also joins Justice's, Justice Gorsuch's opinion that would simply dismiss the case for lack of standing doing away with the special exemption or special exception from usual principles of standing created years ago for establishment challenges. Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor dissent on grounds that a generation ago probably would have commanded a majority of the court. The final case from the last term I would mention is Iancu v. Brunetti, where on free speech grounds, the court struck down uh, more of the Lanham Act that was written to limit the kinds of trademarks the Patent and Trademark Office could grant. Common law is conspicuous here only by its utter absence, as I suppose is originalism too. The PTO had denied a trademark to a clothing designer who boldly prints on his t-shirts the letters F-U-C-T. Uh, the Lanham Act forbidding trademarks that are immoral and scandalous. Justice Kagan fires the big canons of First Amendment doctrine here, the principle of viewpoint neutrality, noting how trademarks have been given to drug enforcement programs like DARE, but denied to bong hits for Jesus, or given for slogans against terrorism, but denied for, quote, baby Al-Qaeda, now, I think James Madison got it right in the report of the Virginia, on the Virginia resolutions when he said that Republican government requires greater liberty for animadversion, for spirited critique, than the common law of seditious libel had permitted. But it seems to me nothing short of nihilism to say a public body can exercise no judgment about what is moral or immoral or decent and indecent, where at issue is not even a question of suppressing speech but the granting of a special privilege thought to yield commercial advantage, a trademark. And even then, when the purpose of the act was, prop the act, the Lanham Act, was probably to prevent fraud and ensure quality and responsibility in commercial exchange. The common law, whatever else might be said of it, was not nihilistic. It allowed liberty to individuals, but allowed communities to sustain a common morality, originally embedded in a moral code that was attached uh, and owed much to a common faith, but later in its successor in the states, the police power, the power to regulate society for the sake of protecting health, safety, and morals, with promotion of education sometimes added to the enumeration. An originalism that turns a blind eye to the question of morals seems hardly original to me, but whether public attention to the moral atmosphere of society is still secured by common law seems to me an open question. Insofar as moral change is customary, after all, perhaps this happens with barely our notice. In the Brunetti case, three justices did dissent, in part, Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Breyer and Sotomayor, who in slightly separate ways would read the statute to strike the immoral clause, but save the scandalous clause, by interpreting the latter to mean obscene or indecent, which these t-shirts obviously were meant to be.
Justice Sotomayor, in fact, proves she means what she says by altering the passage in Cohen v. California where the second Justice Harlan proved himself hit, hip in a late 60s sort of way by quoting verbatim in the US reports the nasty slogan about the draft sewn into the protester's judgment, uh, jacket in uh, Cohen v. California. But Justice Sotomayor puts asterisks after the first letter as decorum demands. I thought it was a fine gesture on her part, and I think Walter Burns would have too. Now, I promised a sixth topic after five cases, and that would be the question of birthright citizenship, where a common law perspective explains what social, the social contract theory cannot. The extension of citizenship in the 14th Amendment by right of birth restored, I think, the English common law understanding that citizenship is established by use solely, the right of the soil or birthplace, rather than by one's parentage as on the continent. The framers would have known this from Cook's report of Calvin's case, as well as from Blackstone's discussion of the term natural born in the commentaries. They certainly knew of Somerset's case, decided in 1772, where Lord Chief Justice Mansfield declared that an African held in slavery became free the moment that his foot touched English soil. And that was one part of the common law that at least some of the founding fathers openly repudiated. But when slavery was abolished, as when a statute against common law was repealed, the natural consequence was to restore the common law, hence citizenship by birthright. Uh, an understanding that James Ho and John Yu have shown was articulated by the congressional framers of the 14th Amendment. Our social contract friends insist that the first clause extending citizenship, as Hobbes and Locke would have said, uh, by arbitrary choice, extended citizenship, as they would have said, by arbitrary choice. We can let you in or not. But I think that the spirit of the clause is rather to right a wrong than to convey a gift. What this means for our current immigration debate isn't clear to me, unless it is that everyone has a right to some country, if not necessarily ours, at least to his birthplace. And I concede to John Eastman that the common law doctrine of allegiance to the king by place of birth cannot be exactly the same when one is born in a republic. But I've meant in these examples to make the case that the common law needs to be considered as an important voice in our legal conversation not that it is the voice that always deserves to win. Now, as this last discussion indicates, I think that common law should guide not only adjudication, but the way we think about legislation. Seen from a common law perspective, new legislation is never created out of nothing. Rather, the legislative power is the power either to declare the law, to put in writing what is already done or what ought to be done given the logic of existing law, or the power to change the law, in the words of Blackstone, to remedy some mischief that has arisen. Sometimes the change is big. For example, when the old common law of master and servant had become so, so tangled in allotting liability for industrial accidents in the manufacturing age that it was replaced by workers' compensation legislation. Sometimes the, the change can be less, at least in words, if not in effect as when a new category is added to anti-discrimination law. In considering legislation, Congress or the state legislature ought to, and often does, identify the mischiefs. But they ought also to be sure to identify the reasons behind the existing legal order, not take for granted its need to be altered or replaced. The presumption uh, of that common law um, is for the tried, the presumption of common law, I'm sorry, the presumption of common law is for the tried and true, a presumption worth restoring, not treated as mere prejudice, though of course it is a rebuttable presumption. Finally, to recover respect for common law in the way it still structures our lives, at least when we think about guilt or innocence, uh, or about freedom of speech, or the rights of property, or our responsibilities as jurors. Uh, to think, uh, to recover respect for common law might help restore a sense of gratitude for our legacy of liberty and even point us back to an appreciation of and an inquiry into not just immemorial custom, but even more permanent things. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Professor Stoner, my name's Will. A uh, question for you is, it seems like one aspect of the originalist skepticism towards the common law would be well articulated by Justice Scalia's embrace of judicial restraint, and he understands that not in a sort of common law model, but one that prefers general rules that essentially disposes of cases before a court would get into the weighing and balancing, and we see that a lot, particularly in the First Amendment context. Uh, what do you think are the shortcomings to that approach toward judicial restraint, if any, and how does your remarks uh, court respond to that? Yeah, the, the common law, you're, you're speaking of uh, Scalia's great article, the common law, or the, the law is a law of rules. The rule of law is the law of rules, right? Uh, and uh, the opposition to the balancing tests, uh, that certainly is consistent with the common law way of thinking, right? The common law is full of all sorts of rules. Actually, so many rules that <laughs> they do sometimes balance against each other, right? They're rules and adages, general principles of law. So I think that... Uh, but the, com the common law response to Scalia there would be, well, mostly right, but uh, different adages have different weights. And they're general principles of justice that explain the rules, actually are needed to even understand what a rule means, usually. And that that's how you're able, or a good judge is able to apply rules to particular cases. Because you see, you still need judgment there. You need judgment of, to understand what the rule is, and then you need judgment to understand what it means in relation to these particular circumstances. Uh, of course, that latter task is, to some extent, the role of a jury in a criminal case. But, uh, but, but it's also something that you know, some judges are better at than others. <laughs> So a judge might get the principle right, but the application wrong. My favorite example of this actually involves my favorite dissent of Justice Alito's, which is in the um, Westboro Baptist case, where Snyder v. Phelps, where, um, uh, again, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, if I remember right, writes the majority opinion. And again, it's all the canons of constitutional First Amendment doctrine. And uh, Justice Alito says, they aren't, they aren't debating policy. <laughs> They're just harassing the man, uh, and, and in the context. There, there are other times and places where the policy can be debated. And I think that's right. I think it's a matter of judgment about what was actually happening. He's absolutely right. And that's, it's not that, he's, that Roberts was wrong about the principle, but the principle doesn't solve the thing. Interestingly, when we talk about originalism versus this or that theory of judging, when we emphasize the theory of judging, we actually often overlook the key to judging, which seems to, and to, to good judging, which is that sort of human judgment that recognizes how to describe a particular action and to understand how it should be characterized as right or wrong. Uh, in the back, Chris DeMuth. You said that the post Holmes no, uh, version of common law that David Strauss employs is very different from the notion of the common law that the founders would have understood. I didn't quite follow that, and I'd like to ask you to elaborate. I, I, got, I got the impression that it had, uh, you made some reference to the role of um, natural law, uh, mm -hmm. to the role of tradition, to the importance of changing social circumstances, so there there are some differences here. But it was it, it. I'd like to I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, good. No, that's that's the point that needs you know development and clarification, isn't it? But uh, there, I think at least at least in principle there's a difference. So now having emphasized practice rather than principle, I'm going to emphasize principle rather than practice for just a minute, right? And and the difference of principle is that. Um, uh, the founders understood the common law as including the natural law and not as something that was infinitely pliable and changeable, even though they would have known that at least some circumstances have altered. In fact, when they spoke about common law, they always qualified it by saying, the common law in America is the old law we've inherited by, from England as adapted to our circumstances or changed by our legislators. Uh, legislatures, right? So, you know, primogenitor and entail never came over to Massachusetts, 
And somehow slavery wormed its way into Virginia, <laughs> even though neither, I mean, the one was clearly a part of the common law and the latter wasn't. Um, so, um, uh, but, but they didn't, I guess they always thought there was some kind of anchor to it, even though it was changing. It's it, interesting, now to change the metaphor just a little bit, one of the best metaphors of this was uh, given by Chief Justice Hale in England. He's the man who sort of kept law afloat during the English, uh, during Cromwell and the Protectorate, for he served during then and, and into the Restoration and kept the common law somewhat continuous for that whole time. And Hale said, look, it's, it's like the, was it the uh, Argo, the ship of Jason the, uh, Jason the Argonauts, the Argo, the ship, where at sea, it was always at sea, and they would have to replace boards that would rot out. But it's the same ship, even though the boards are different and have changed. And so I think the analogy was that particular rules can change over time. Hale wrote one of the first histories of the common law, so he was very much aware of the way particular rules can change. But they change in response to changing circumstances. The principle being that a rule that is perfectly good in one circumstance doesn't apply <laughs> in another circumstance, right? When I teach my students, I say, look, when you were a kid and it was your dad's car, you had to ask permission to use it. <laughs> You've grown up at your own car, you don't have to ask permission. In the same way, it's a different set of circumstances, so a different rule about permission. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know that I've worked that analogy out the best, but but uh, we can think of, of real examples. Actually, the, the, uh, my favorite book on this is Edward Levy's little book, Introduction to Legal Reasoning. And he describes how the old common law rule, now how does it go? There's sort of two discussions and he brilliantly weaves them together. But one has to do with, it has to do with who's responsible for a dangerous, uh, the manufacture of a dangerous good and whether a third party uh, is responsible for it. The whether the manufacturer is under the common law. Let's let me go back. Under the common law, the person who made the wagon could be sued if there's a defect in the wagon by the person who bought the wagon from him, but not by the person that that person then sold the wagon to, because it's too remote. The common law would think it might have been altered. Who would know? Manufacturer's not liable. But in modern circumstances, manufacturers routinely would go through wholesalers and. Uh, uh, the manufactured good followed, uh, followed several, uh, several courses of exchange before it was actually sold to the customer who would use it. But Judge Cardozo in New York, writes the McPherson v. Buick case, right, famous case, he says, look, something like this, at least a dangerous item, uh, like, like a car, has to be treated differently. It's a, it's a different kind of thing, a different kind of danger than a wagon was. You, couldn't, you could just inspect, anybody could be presumed to inspect, be able to inspect a wagon. Not so with a car, he says, and it's dangerous. So there you've got a different kind of thing. And even though the analogy seemed pretty good at first between the carriage and the horseless carriage, eventually it was really different enough that it made sense to gain the same point that uh, Someone who's the cause of a defect should be <laughs> responsible for, or should be liable for any damage that the defect causes. That's the underlying principle. But it gets a, it turns into an opposite sort of rule about third parties. Once you're dealing with manufactured goods, than back when you were dealing with craft-made goods. So, so uh, if that's all Cardoz and Holmes are about, that's no problem <laughs> to the founders. But see, I think they're about something more than that. And you see that especially, uh, none, I, I want to say not in Chief Justice Hughes' cases, where he really is saying that uh, the founding principles have to be understood differently in the context of our modern economy than in the context of an 18th century economy. Uh, but, but, um, but I think it's certainly different uh, once you get to Griswold v. Connecticut and Roe v. Wade and the cases that come out of that, where you're talking about, um, well, there have been some technological developments, there have been some social changes, there's some attempt to argue that, but uh, the, the basic facts are known. <laughs> actually, they're better known than they were before. Uh, so actually, I think the logic of how the law should change goes in the opposite direction. 
Paul Edwards, Brigham Young University. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts about um, equitable originalism. That is, in Article 3, we have mention of courts of law and equity. And given the way that constitutional courts and have used uh, injunctive relief in such sweeping ways in modern jurisprudence, do you have some sense about how courts of equity should be understood through a, an originalist lens? Yes, um, thank you. The, the best work I know on that and on which I rely on that is Gary McDowell's book on equity in the Constitution. And McDowell's argument is that, though it can even be generalized, and I hinted at that, is that there was a huge change that takes place when the procedure that used to separate law and equity was merged in the 1930s. It used to be that when you came to court, you had to declare whether you were suing at law or filing what was called a bill of equity, I think. I'm not expert on this, so maybe someone is and can correct me on that. Uh, a bill of equity. And the idea was that if you went at law, that would be common law, right, uh, that that could establish a precedent and uh, uh, you would be following the general rules. But in equity, you would take account some kind of problem that wasn't anticipated by the rules. For Blackstone himself talks about it, and the English had, see, the English had separate courts of equity, right? Uh, if you thought that the common law was working in injustice, the answer wasn't to get the judges to change the common law. Uh, if it was just a particular, particular area of the circumstance, it was to appeal to the chancellor in the court of equity and get a writ running from him uh, uh, to, to deal with that peculiarity of your case. Uh, and what the Americans did is at the federal level, they said the court, there would be the same bodies, would be courts of law and equity, but from the beginning, I think the Judiciary Act of 1789, I, if I'm not mistaken, already set up separate process. You had to declare one or the other. Uh, and so you could only use injunctions, right, if you were in a suited equity. Uh, because again, that's one of those exceptional things, one of those ex exceptional circumstances where harm might be done that couldn't be compensated for by money afterwards, which is the usual procedure at law. Uh, but once you combine them, <laughs> Then you have the force of precedent at law plus the force that was made to deal only with extraordinary circumstances, the power of injunction. And, uh, and so I think that's worked something that's really different from what was intended. But why did that happen? Because Congress changed the process. Uh, that is one of many things, I think, in which the congressional reforms of the 1920s and 30s could be revisited if we want to revisit the power of courts. I mean, to say that oh, we can't do anything about it, so it's not, that's not an Article Three thing. For 150 years under Article Three, you had to declare one or the other, and you didn't give judges sweeping rules of equity. Goodness, look, the notion that a single district judge can issue a nationwide injunction, when was the first one of those? I think it was 2015. It was a Republican judge down in Texas dealing with DACA or something, and then it got flipped over and used in another way. And... You know, it is my joke about the old common law point, the memory of man runneth not to the contrary. How long is that? I mean, in this case, maybe five years, you know? So I, I think that uh, actually there's a lot that could be done with regard to the courts seemingly overstepping bounds just by looking at not redefining the moment of judgment, because that's for judges to say what the law means in a particular case. That's their Article Three power. But the question of jurisdiction is defined by Congress. And the question of remedy, right? Paying damages or, or uh, issuing injunctions is defined by Congress. And they have ample, uh, they have ample uh, uh, ability still to alter that if they, if we can figure out the way to advise them to do it and they can summon the political will. Um, we have time for one last question, but do you remember you're standing in the way of uh, cheese and wine. So, so, so the pressure is on. <laughs> Make it good. Professor Merrill is a brave man and that won't, uh, the, the anger of everyone right. else will not right. dissuade him from getting How long the can I talk now? <laughs> <laughs> Don't so, push so Jim, um, I'm interested uh, in your discussion of common law. At one point you gestured to natural law as uh, somehow that common law was looking to the natural law. Some understanding of natural law was part of common law. 
And um, I wonder if you can, uh, my big question is, can you talk about that a little bit more? Uh, what exactly does that mean? Do you, um, would it be a good idea for judges to be instructed, say, by political theorists? And the reason that I ask this is that I uh, seem to remember. No, that, that's, that's easy, right? That's, I mean, no. I seem but, to remember uh, Walter okay. Burns what being else? quite yeah, right. grouchy about this on this topic, yeah. right? That uh, I think he was thinking of Rawls and Dworkin. right. right. But, um, and, and I was reminded of a piece that he wrote entitled The Illegitimacy of Appeals to Natural Law and Constitutional Interpretation. Um, can you, I mean, can you talk a little bit about, are, are you at odds with what he's saying there or are you in accord with what he's I, saying there? I, I don't think so. But what I, what I would say is that, no, oh, I don't think I'm at odds with, with what he says about the illegitimacy of an appeal to natural law in uh, in, in the um, uh, in, in constitutional law, although it is true that uh, the ju judicial oath is to do justice, right? So there is some reference to a real virtue or a real state of things, not just to mechanically apply the law. That's not what they swear, right? Um, but yeah, I think that the common law was a way that was was a a way of taming natural law and, may, and, and what accessing some of its virtues, that is the ability to correct rules that begin to work injustices, uh, that allow uh, particular interests or arrangements to interfere with uh, uh, the right, but to do it in a way that was always limited, always uh, measured by the particular circumstances of the case and by the need to um, follow precedent case to case. So, you know, we can recognize sometime, I and mean, we can still recognize, right, when the law works in injustice, even when someone is following the law. Judges will sometimes say this, right, in constitutional cases. Well, this is an uncommonly silly law, they'll say something like that, or, uh, or something of that sort. But the question is, is there any way in which they can prevent real injustice being done to a real person? And um, if what, what the art of the common law judge seemed to be able to by focusing on the particular case and drawing on the various precedents, but also these deeper adages of natural justice, you could say, to make sure justice wasn't done, injustice wasn't done to particulars without having to redesign <laughs> uh, on a model, some kind of model of social justice to address any particular wrong. So it was a, a sort of art of trying to have it both ways in that way and of recognizing that it partly did, right? Ever Cook calls the common law a perfection of reason, but he doesn't mean it was all thought up at once and perfect. He means, and here David Strauss quotes him on this, that a lot of people have thought about each of these cases and it's when you add them together with all their variety, with all those different rules that govern different areas of life, and you know, acknowledging, I think in a kind of Aristotelian way, uh, the, the immense plurality of human goods, uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, that this could proceed in an orderly way uh, that does justice without, uh, uh, without abandoning law for the arbitrary judgment of the judge, right, was always decried by the common lawyers. Well, uh, before we head off to uh, the reception, uh, please join me in thanking Professor Stoner for a marvelous presentation. Thank you. Uh, and again, thank you for coming, and uh, there's wine and cheese uh, out, out the doors. <laughs>